My name is Brian Chapman. I'm the project manager for the project to be presented this evening. I'm assigned to the project management section of MassDOT's Highway Division headquarters in Boston. I was directed by Chief Engineer Patricia Levenberg to conduct tonight's hearing. This is a two-phase project. First, we will be presenting phase three, and that's MassDOT presenting phase three. And then the city will present phase two. So if you want to stay for both phases, uh, please uh, stay for phase two when we're finished here. On the end is Imogene Hatch from Brown, Richardson and Rowe. Nina Brown is also from Brown, Richardson and Rowe. John Hedrickson from Faye, Swafford and Thorndike. Mike Papadopoulos from MassDOT's project management section. Bill Travis from MassDOT's District 5 office. David Fraser is of Arlington typing and mailing. He'll be making a verbatim transcript of tonight's hearing. Don Oliver and Linda Walsh are from MassDOT's Right-of-Way Bureau. My function is to review and recommend procedures that your municipality will utilize in acquiring these rights. The procedures used must comply with both federal and state regulations. The current design plans indicate that there are two fee acquisitions and or permanent easements required and that other areas may require temporary construction easements and or rights of entry. Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out to hear about the project. We're really excited about it, and we hope that, we hope that you enjoy hearing where the design and the development has, has led us. So this is just a brief little description of what our slide will be. We've sort of gone over most of this. Um, we're going to go through the project overview, design elements, furnishings, amenities, and plantings, and then the bridge and the trail design. We'll talk a little bit about the project schedule, and then we'll open it up to questions and comments. The project team, as you know, is, is a diverse group of individuals all working hard to bring this project together, um, including the City of Fall River, MassDOT, the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and then there's the design team. Um, Brown, Richardson, and Rowe, Faith, Bofford, and Thorndike, Surveying and Mapping Consultants, SMC, and LEC Environmental Consultants. So as we've said just briefly, there are two phases to the overall, uh, the overall vision of this project. Um, there's phase two, which we'll be talking about as after this official hearing is complete. And the one that we're going to focus on right now is MassDOT phase three, which is approximately 3,300 linear feet. It's um, from roughly Quickishan Street to Brayton Avenue, connecting to the existing path that, that it, um, is, ends at Brayton Avenue right now, which is technically phase one. Um, there are two proposed bridges within phase three, and like I said, it connects phase two, which will be built um, as part of a city project, and the previously constructed phase one, and there is a $1.4 million construction cost estimate associated with phase three. So this is roughly the area that we're, that we're talking about for the overall vision. The green line down in the right-hand corner of, of the image is the phase one portion. Blue is phase three, which is what we're going to be talking about in detail in just a second. And phase two is shown in orange. So like I said, the phase three project limits extend from roughly Quickishan Street, which you can see right up here, to Brighton Avenue. So when we first started looking at the design for the, the rail trail conversion, we sort of looked at <coughs> some of the existing elements within Fall River and this, this corridor in particular, some of the industrial elements, some of the natural wetlands that exist along the corridor, and some of the history of what the, um, the corridor has been used for in the past um, and how that has shaped what it is now. Um, there are some existing, like I mentioned, wetland elements and industrial elements that we're sort of drawing upon here. We developed a um, logo and a branding together with various individuals in the city and project team members coming up with um, a sort of sense of identity for the trail. And then we started looking at some of the more specific design elements that would go along the trail, some a little bit more on the landscape um, furnishing amenities side of things. 
We worked with that sort of more industrial theme that I talked about before, something over overscaled, um, large, very sturdy, um, very uh, durable materials. So these are the benches that have been selected. Um, they include um, very solid, like I said, sturdy, replaceable bench slots out of Ipe wood um, and uh, solid steel metal components. This is a little bit more of what they would look like scale-wise in, in situ. Bike racks. And uh, at, some, um, at some of the entries, namely um, further along the trail, there will be um, some custom fencing that's designed utilizing <laughs> reclaimed rail segments from the trail, as well as solid granite posts and a woven wire steel mesh in between. Sort of trying to create that sense of identity and durability, um, and also sort of bring an element of uh, um, design and, and intention to the entries. It's an image of some of the trail signs that we're putting together, sort of you are here mapping, so that folks will be able to locate themselves, locate how long it might take them to get from one place to another on the trail, where they could get to on the trail if you're standing in one spot, can I get over to Rodman Street from here? Um, and then uh, there will also be this same sort of style will be used for some interpretive panels talking about history, ecology, um, located in different spots along the trail. And then there's also some location markers uh, that'll tell you when you've gotten to certain entry points and intersections along the trail. Um, if you take a left here, you'll head down towards Britland Park. If you take a right here, you'll go towards Quickishan Street. Again, those are all using uh, solid granite, so we're talking about some very durable, long-lasting, permanent, but you know, classic design. Uh, the plantings, um, selection criteria, um, we were looking at for plantings, um, colorful, natural, yet easy to maintain, hardy and disease resistant, um, adaptable to the local environment, and promoting wildlife habitat and use, use, utilizing native um, plantings wherever that is feasible for the environmental conditions that we're trying to plant within. So these are some of the trees that have been selected for the project. As you can see, a lot of them are, are on the native, the native side, um, and they do, like I said, provide a lot of, um, a lot of habitat, a lot of fall color, spring color, that should be nice and diverse for the trail users. Um, and then here are some of the shrubs. John's going to talk about this. I'm going to introduce John Hendrickson from Faye Spofford and Thorndike, Thorndike who is um, going to talk about some of the engineering sides to the bridges and the trail. Thanks, Imogene. Now that Imogene has finished talking about all the pretty stuff along the trail, um, I'd like to talk about the actual design of the trail and the bridges. And the bridges are actually boardwalks, but we do call the bridges. And then after that, I'd like to actually show you photos of the existing trail, just so you know where it's going. The first step we did was a geotechnical program. We actually took borings at all six bridges along the trail. There's two bridges in this section, but we took borings along all six bridges. So we can determine the type of foundation that we would need. At the beginning of this project, we're hoping that we can reuse the existing uh, boardwalks or bridge trestles. You know, we said, well, they've been there for 150 years, they hold up the train, they should be able to hold up a bike path. Unfortunately, when we actually did a study, back in the day when they did the creosoting, they only dipped the wood into creosote and only the outside got covered. Today, if you get a uh, pressure treated piece of wood, it's all the way through, but back in the day, it was only covered on the outside. So if you look at this picture, you can see where the wood is rotted out. And unfortunately, throughout the entire trail, this is the case, and unfortunately, again, we were not able to reuse the existing uh, wood trestles. So what we are proposed to do is put a wooden boardwalk. Um, the next three slides are actually engineering drawings, and I do have photos afterwards. So if um, it's tough to read these, I will show photos. But the boardwalk is itself has a 12-foot wide clear deck. Uh, the wood is Ipe on the deck and on the handrails. The only uh, metal is the helical foundation screws, which are shown on the bottom of the slide. And we are using these screws because they are environmentally sensitive. They really just screw right into the ground and you don't impact the wetlands. This would be an elevation or looking at it from the side. Uh, as you can see, we do have two, two railings and we have a mesh over the railings, which I'll show a photo of. We also have um, on every other uh, beam, we have a 45 degree angle pile. That's to, for more support for the bridge. 
And we should say that these bridges will be supporting ambulances and maintenance vehicles. And this would be a plan view of the uh, boardwalk. It's almost similar to if you were putting a deck in your backyard. We have the, the deck on top and the beams underneath. So this is a photo of a recently constructed boardwalk on the Al White Brook Parkway. And it is the Al White Brook Trail. And as you can see, the EPA wood is on the deck and on the handrails. So this is extremely similar to what the boardwalks will look, out, look like out there once we're complete. This is a picture of a, a, an existing boardwalk out in Salisbury. It won't look like this, but I did want to show the railing, if you look on the right side. And because of requirements of a bridge slash boardwalk, we can only allow a six inch gap any place along the trail so that kids don't get stuck in the, in the uh, railing. So instead of putting an almost solid board down the, the um, handrail, we're putting a mesh fence so that when you walk along the trail, you'll actually get to see through the fence, see the water, see the grasses, and see everything. So we felt that it was a much better design. And this would be the elevation view that I showed. You can see the uh, piles going down the 45 degree angle, uh, helical screws going into the ground. And this is a photo underneath. Um, again, you can see the 45 degree beams every other, every other post and the uh, horizontal ones going down. Now, on the uh, trail itself, the trail will be 10 foot wide for two meters concrete. It will be sloped one way so that the drains will sheet off of the trail one way. We will have three foot shoulders on each side, which are basically grass strips. So if you happen to ride your bike off the trail, you'll have three feet to recover and not hit a tree or not hit a post or anything like that. So you have three feet on the side to recover and to get back on the trail. And that will be grass. And then we have an additional five feet where we are planning to take out dead trees, limbs, or anything else that will uh, impact the trail. And this is a, a photo of the trail actually out on the um, uh, along the peninsula out there today. Now I'll, I'll show you photos along the corridor. If you go to page eight in your uh, handout, it shows a map of the corridor. So I will be going from Quickershawn Street, and I will be going towards the um, towards the east. So the first um, item that would come on is the ramp to, to 24. This this trail goes under I-195, two ramps to 24. Actually, the, uh, you know, the, um, the city is separated by 195, and unfortunately, with Rodman Street connection, we have to connect this to both sides of 195. So as you can see, the ramp to 24 is, on, is the first bridge, and the second bridge is a 195 bridge. This shows a picture from the opposite angle. The 195 bridge will have lighting underneath it, and we should point out that the trail is <coughs> on the dusk facility, so that the lighting will be on just during the day. It will not be on a The next thing we come across is the bridge over the Marsh Wetlands. We're assuming back 100 years ago when they built this, this was probably a part of the river, but it, it has been filled in with uh, wetland plants. So we will be putting a boardwalk at this location. And this gives you kind of a cross section of the uh, what the boardwalk will look like. You can see up on top is an actual photo of an existing boardwalk, and we placed it over the plan that we have. You can see the helical screws on the bottom of the foundations. And as we go along further, we go on another uh, ramp to 24. We go underneath this. And then the trail comes right up against the parking lot for Cloverleaf Office Park. Um, this would be a great spot for them to go out at lunch. They'll be able to walk all the way down to Wetupple Pond or all the way into Britland Park. And this is an overview of Fay Street in the context of the city. You can see the dashed line. To the right would be uh, the phase one, which is already constructed, and to the left would be the phase three project. I'm sorry, phase two project. Yes. Now, further down, we're crossing right now. As you follow the orange line down, if we were to continue that um, design, it would be a severe angle on right now, which would be which would take the people walking in on bikes too long to cross. So the best situation is to actually cross them at 90 degrees. So we follow the shoulder of Brayton Ave and we actually cross at 90 degrees and meet the existing trail. At this location, we are proposing to have a push button pedestrian signal. As you, as you probably all know, the vehicles here go 55 miles an hour. There's two lanes of traffic and the sight distance is really poor. So at this location, we will have, we will stop, push a button and the light will, will actually go to red. 
and this is a landscape plan of the same location. If you're coming down from the left <coughs> down to the right, we actually put a, a S curve in, and that's to slow down the people on the bikes. So when they come to the stop at Brayton Hill, they'll be going slow. And you can see we have uh, landscape <coughs> plants uh, throughout this section. Of the and this is the trail terminus. You probably most have walked. It's a beautiful walk, and we will actually meet at this particular location. Now the project schedule, uh, they've talked about the right-of-way appraisal and process. Final design plans. For this particular section of the trail, we, have some, we will have completed the 100% plans uh, by the end of this week. And then this mass DOT will then review those plans. So it should be 100% complete by the end of this week. What we will do is take on any comments that we do receive tonight and incorporate them into those plans. Uh, we are also submitting the notice of intent shortly to the Conservation Commission. Obviously, this is a very environmentally sensitive area, so we do have to do a notice of intent. We also have to do an environmental notification form, or ENF, which goes to MEPA. And then, as mentioned before, uh, construction is anticipated in the fall of 2013. And that concludes our uh, presentation. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is a normal procedure to ask elected officials to offer the comments first. Are there any federal, state, or local officials who would like to speak at this time? The hearing, if there are no elected officials, the hearing is now open to the public and we welcome your questions or comments. Yes, sir. Uh, Rick Schwartz, I'm part of uh, the Forum Bicycle Committee. I'm also from the Eric Anthony Will people, real men. Uh, many questions. First of all, who's going to maintain the bushes once they're planted? You're saying we've got all these beautiful bushes and everything else, which I think is an overkill to begin with, but who's going to be maintaining it once these are planted? That bothers me. Number two, how high is the fence rail going to be? Uh, the schematic showed anywhere between three feet to eight feet. Uh, I'm curious, actually, over the bridges, how high is that going to be? The, the fence should be three feet six inches. Three the, feet six inches. It's actually the schematic said three to eight. But there's actually a design standards for, for railings on the trail itself and railings on the bridge. Okay. Also. How many seconds are we going to be allowed to cross Brayden Avenue? I've been at many intersections where you get halfway through and the light's already against you. We have timed that because of the um, length of that. We have timed it so that you can walk the entire length from one side to the other and you don't have the to The entire start. length or do you have to go halfway and then press the button again? No, we have, we have done it so you can do the entire length timing wise. Will there be a secondary button in the middle? Yes. yes. Uh, the other problem that I see is the deck. The decks look beautiful. House, and, but what bothers me is you're saying three to five percent slope, which I understand, reasonable. How slippery is that going to be when it is wet? The bridges themselves are at zero percent. Bridges actually, themselves zero. Zero okay. percent profile and zero percent grade. So we actually designed them to look flat. All right, that's a misunderstanding then when I heard it. So the bridges are flat. The roadway, which is asphalt, I assume, yes. will have a 3 to 5 percent grade. It, it will have a cross slope of 2 percent. 2 percent. And the maximum on the profile, I don't think we go over 1 percent. But there might be some places we go 2 percent. Yeah, even that sometimes bicycling at different speeds could be hazardous. That's why I was questioning that. Right. Was that a good question? Um, they, they do allow, by ADA uh, code, to go up to 5 percent. Five percent. That's what I thought. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. And as to the plantings, um, the city of Fall River is responsible for. Oh, sorry. Is, is the city of Fall River will be as the owner will be responsible for maintain, maintenance of. Well, of not being technical, would that be the public works or the park department? Yeah. But right now, the, uh, the portion of where the bike path is going belongs to the Mass DOT Rail Division. All right. And the plan is that this portion will be uh, transferred or raised or given a permanent easement to the uh, city of Fall River. And from that point after, the city of Fall River will assume responsibility of maintaining uh, the backpack. Okay. 
Well, as you point out, on many, many, many trails, friends of the trail groups have been formed mm -hmm. that do the maintenance for the city. Mm -hmm. And that happens on quite a few things. That I've seen too. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Hi, Brian Pearson, also with the Toronto the Bicycle Committee. Um, listening to the beginning, we were talking about uh, the right of way. And, and I was wondering, first of all, is there any problems uh, or how's the right of way coming? Um, the right of way is coming along fine. The reason that John and I are both here is there's actually municipal right of way impacts, which means um, the requirements um, will be the responsibility of the city. Um, generally, those are on um, land that's not owned by the state. Although you know we are acquired, they will be acquiring the permanent easement from the rail division for the construction of the project. Um, Don is here because um, in the area of the bridges, the state highway layout, yeah. and so there'll be a need for some alteration to the access lines in that area. So um, that will also be handled through our state highway section. But so is there any un unforeseen holdouts? Is there anything, or is, is everything going smoothly with the uh, right of way? Well. Um, I can't speak for the city um, on where they are at, but I, we have been meeting with them. Um, things do seem to be progressing along. Everybody's working cooper cooperatively with one another, so I anticipate that things will um, progress. One other question. I, I noticed there's a new layout. Before, there was going to be a bridge like overhang when you came off of Brayton Avenue over the South of Tuffa. That's gone, which I'm very glad to see. Did that help reduce the cost? of the project? It helped reduce it quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. That's it. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Sir? Um, your comment where you're saying there's going to be a stoplight, Tony Dias, uh, citizen, um, at the Brighton Avenue crossover, you had mentioned that potentially people will be at the island if they happen to uh, leave when it says three seconds left to, to be able to cross. Have you calculated potentially how many bicyclers could be within that island space? No, we haven't, to be honest with you. But it, the, it's it's made so that people will come up, push a button, wait, and it says actually on the sign, wait for a signal to turn red, and then cross. Um, well, so that's, it's made for them to go all the way across. Right, but my concern is that group that's <laughs> coming at the very end of it, they're going to decide to go, and they're going to get caught in the middle. Right. And they usually like to ride in groups. Right. How many people would fit in that island? Because that's only like four feet, five well, feet wide. No, the actual, the actual island, because we pushed it back from where we originally was. So the island where we crossed is between 12 and 15 feet. So we do have more room. I, the island you're talking about is where the left turn lane is, and that is like three feet. I'm, I'm, yeah, I was talking about the space in between north versus south or east west, whatever it is. The, the traffic medium. So the that's approximately strip. 12. So right here? Yes. Yeah, so that's approximately, oh, in between. In yeah. between, oh. yes. So that's 10 feet wide. 10 feet wide. Right, yeah. And about 12 feet in length, I guess you would call it. Thank you. And my last question is, is it basically the budget isn't <coughs> allowing for a pedestrian bridge to go over it? Pedestrian. Well. Pedestrian bridge over the island? The, the entire roadway, because, oh, I mean. Roadway. Uh, that would be one concern, but the other is, is what Tuckle Pond is on the other side, so it would be a huge environmental impact. But that, that would, um, that bridge, my, my assumption would be cost about a million dollars, probably more, probably between one and one point five million. That would, that would be very expensive. And we feel that this is a, you know, safe condition with the stoplight. Thank you. Cool. to the bike path, are they going to be inside, um, because I'd be concerned with vandalism if they're inside. It'd, it'd probably be better if they are outside of the entrances. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Okay. Is, do we know where they're going to be? That yeah. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know if you had others. Yeah. Um, no, the benches, there aren't actually benches located at, at the phase, along the phase three segment of the trail. In phase two, there, there are some benches and they're located just inside the trail. They are literally about 10 feet from the sidewalk. Is this phase three or is it part of phase two? Two. So I can't say my question then. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be time later, though. Okay. Oh, okay. I didn't understand. You said 
I realize we're only talking about phase three. If you mention phase two construction, mm -hmm. would you say what you just said slowly so I could take it in? Phase two and phase three are likely to be built at around the same schedule, around the same time. Yeah, I think I heard this fall. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, that was approval. Uh, uh, I just have uh, on the plantings of uh, we have. I'm sure you've consulted with the local folks and the wonderful tree lady in town. Um, the area itself, and I have walked all of that, all of the place you're going to build. Is quite wild. Mm -hmm. I hope you would keep it that way mm -hmm. as much as you possibly could. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. There are a lot of invasive species currently on the trail, so there will be some removal of some of the invasives. Right. And it's very hard because, for <coughs> yep. example, clover is an invasive species. Oh. So it's very hard to, I, I know what you're talking about, mm -hmm. and some of them. There probably is one in there, but I don't know what it is. I don't see one. Oh, <laughs> I think you're okay. But what I'm getting at is, now this, now, what about parking? The land, is there any, are you going to have any parking lots along the trail? There, there are no parking lots planned at this point. Good. Um, I, the reason for that is it's very, there's not a lot of land area. Yeah. That's right. So, so it needs to be conserved as much as possible. Okay, that's... Uh, we fully agree. <laughs> rolling on. The, when you walk under the tunnels, it is quite dark. These are the, the two tunnels that, that... You said you were going to turn the tunnels off at 4.30, around December 22nd. Which is when it gets dark. It was yeah. remarkably precise of us. Yeah. Well, I just say I cycle, and I know when I have to put my put my lights. I know when I'm supposed to put lights on my bicycle. And I'm wondering if that seems a little early, yeah, well, particularly in the winter. Because these will also be transportation routes to and from work, and those those tunnels are if you go alone. They're actually a little scary. Yes. I'm wondering if it could be anything like a like a, a motion switch or or anything like that that would help you would help that problem. I I don't know. Well, the, the rule on bikeways is the same with on tox. It's you know dawn to dusk, and um, you don't want you do not want to give the people the impression that the, the, the trail is lit and it's safe because if you're a mile down the trail. You know, you're out there by yourself. Even though it's lit and you, and you can see everything, you actually, know. Actually, you're not necessarily by yourself if you're with someone else. Right. Um, <laughs> right. what, what I am saying is, is that the, if, a tour, if I were to take you, we might get, it gets pretty dark inside that tunnel uh, at dusk. Yes. And I'm just, if there's anything you can do, do it. I realize you're dealing, you seem like you're dealing with a rule, like the dawn to dusk. Right. <coughs> and and they, they will be triggered by uh, light sensors. It's not a timer, it's a light sensor. That so time. when the light level gets to a certain... But there's no motion. Okay. Yeah. So point. when it starts to get dark enough that it triggers triggers the light to, to turn off, it'll do that. I know it seems opposite. We're turning the lights off when it gets dark, uh, but that that'll be the the light outside of the tunnel when it gets dark enough outside, then the lights will not turn on. Right. I'm also aware this is not simply a bicycle route. This yep. is a walking route for people to go to work yep. and so forth. And it most you know, and it's, it sounds like it's cutting off a little early. That's and those two tunnels are the difficult places. That's yes. Okay. I agree. Thank you. I just want to say a few uh, words about phase two and the overall project on behalf of both the uh, Commonwealth 
and the uh, City of Fall River. Uh, we have been working for quite some time now with the uh, City of Fall River, Mayor Flanagan, uh, and representatives of the administration here to first uh, decide on this project and to uh, carry it forward. Uh, there, believe it or not, are quite a uh, few background steps that go forward to uh, getting this project to this stage. We've been working with uh, the design team you've already heard from, from uh, Brown and Sunderman Rowe and Face Buffer and Thorndike, the engineers, to uh, move this project forward. Uh, there was a lot going into uh, figuring out the route, figuring out the viability of some of the infrastructure associated with the project, and really pleased to uh, have reached this point, yet another milestone in the uh, process of getting this project to happen. So the, the uh, overall project, as I think you know, is uh, about 1.4 miles of conversion of the former Watupa secondary uh, rail line, uh, basically from the end of phase one near Watupa Pond and the Advanced Materials Center uh, through to uh, basically Brooklyn Park and Plymouth, almost to Plymouth Avenue, uh, along with some spur connections to Rodman Street. Uh, the project as a whole is being paid for from two sources you just heard about, the so-called phase three. Uh, the portion paid for with uh, funding from the uh, transportation sources and that's being advanced by my colleagues from the Mass Department of Transportation. Phase two, on the other hand, is being paid for through the program I manage, Gateway City Parks at Energy and Environmental Affairs. Uh, that portion basically runs uh, from Brooklyn Park uh, and the, that portion, the western portion of uh, the project in the uh, City of Fall River through to the end of the phase three project that you just heard about, basically connecting all of this uh, the uh, project, as you can see, is in design, permitting as well, and we are looking forward to actually uh, building this project in the near future. Uh, my office, Energy and Environmental Affairs, has uh, set aside funds for the uh, purchase of uh, some of the land interests that we need uh, in order to build this, and also for the uh, construction of the Phase two portion of the project. Uh, I think both uh, Mayor Flanagan and the administration are very happy to be working uh, on this. Uh, you, you should be uh, expecting a more formal announcement of the project uh, in the relatively near future. We started to work on uh, an event beyond a, a public hearing like this to, uh, to make the project known and to, uh, to publicize the uh, investment being made by uh, all the parties in moving this project forward. I think that's probably enough. I, I'm going to obviously be here with the rest of the project team to uh, answer questions, but on behalf of uh, the city and the state were really pleased to be moving this along. So, phase two is approximately 4,900 linear feet in total, so um, substantially longer than phase three, because it includes um, the connection from Britland Park to Quickishan Street, as well as the spur that goes down towards Rodman Street, thereby connecting that section of the city um, north or to come north or west at that point. Yeah, north, northwest, that handles this, up to um, Britland Park um, underneath 195, which has not been possible previously. There are five proposed bridges um, in this section of the project, and as mentioned, anticipated construction um, bidding could happen as early as this fall, with construction likely to begin either late fall or spring. And there is $3.9 million construction cost estimate for phase two. Significant, um, significant section of construction. Um, here, um, starting Britland Park, connecting to Quickishan Street at the end of Phase 3, and the spur from Rodman Street up to the main trail. These are just some, uh, some, some of the things I just talked yeah. about, including the, the Rodman Street connection underneath Route 195. Um, yeah, over bridge number two, back to bridge number three, which I'm going to talk about bridges in a bit, but these are some of the bridges that we're talking about. Some of these are quite long um, in here, boardwalk they will be, and then this is a very short little segment that'll go over the existing canal at the edge of Britland Park to connect the trail to Britland. So as, you, as many of you have probably observed, um, Fall River has been involved in making some significant improvements uh, to Britland Park through a grant that was received um, a park grant, um, a grant from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The improvements were made during the fall of 2012 into um, spring of this year. They included um, a turf, um, an uh, artificial turf soccer field, as well as actually this pavement, is, this rendering is a little out of date, um, but this pavement was taken out and um, the trail along the bottom here 
will connect up to our trail, and then there's another little piece of segment that comes to the entrance of Britland Park. So, uh, in other words, the, the connection to Britland Park is an important one for us and for our trail, we feel, because it's, it's really um, developing that extension of green space that we really feel that the city will benefit from. So these are some of the, the highlighted landscape areas that we have developed along, along the trail. Um, many of you who were here at the previous public information meeting probably already saw some of the, develop, uh, some of the plans that we had for these areas, um, including the Britain Park connection, what we're entitling the Overlook, which is essentially a space to stop, rest, uh, take a moment, observe the scenery, um, gather with a friend, um, and then down here, the Rodman Street entry and the Quickishan Street entry. These are sort of two main trailheads. So this is um, a, basically what the Rodman Street entry would um, look like. There's a significant amount of, um, of ceremony here with some bike rack benches. Um, this is where the decorative fence will be, which you see over here, the entry fence. Um, and then there's also a trail sign, which is actually up in this location now. So this um, um, is the custom fencing that we talked about before. This will be all along the, the road at, um, at Robin Street. It sort of goes this way and then this way. And it sort of wraps around. So this is, um, again, some, some bikes and some seating available there. There's a, another trail sign, you are here map. This is another location where we have um, some of those um, granite uh, location markers telling you what <coughs> you're coming to and what direction you should go. And John will talk about the traffic crossing at, um, a little bit later on for Quickishan Street in our presentation. This is, again, sort of what it looks like today, a rendering of more like what it'll look like when when the job is mine, which is actually going to be interpreted this place. This is a section where we like to rebuild some of the um, existing rail there, leave it in place so that people can see and sort of envision in their minds what was there that you are now riding and walking and running on, um, and talk a little bit about what that history has been and has meant to this corridor. Um, and then there's you know a space for some benches, gathering, seating, and some plantings to just um, make it a pleasant place to be. And again, this is sort of what we're talking about as a before and more what it would look like after. Again, the benches and John. Well, the trail design in phase two is pretty much the same as on phase three, so I'll concentrate on the bridges and the crossing at Quickly mm -hmm. As Imogene mentioned, there's five bridges along this section of the corridor. The first bridge is um, at this canal. To the right is Britland Park, and so to connect to Britland Park, we had to go over this open channel. So we will put a, be putting a new foundation behind the stone walls of this, uh, of, uh, I guess it's a channel, and then the bridge will be on top of that. This is the bridge for the railroad spur from Rodman Street. Um, some of you might know this did catch on fire a while ago, but this would be the connection to Rodman Street. This is bridge number three, which is at a uh, pretty much a V with the bridge that I just showed you. And this is actually the deck over bridge three. As you can see on the right, they back then when they did have the railroads, they, they built a walkway next to it so you could walk up and down the, the um, tracks if there was a train parked there. And we think back in the day that you know they probably did park trains here. The uh, the station is a little bit further down on Plymouth Street, so we think that they did might have parked some some uh, trains here. And this is bridge number four. You can see they're all similar. They all look the same. They're all trestle bridges. And this is the graphic we showed before with the proposed deck on top and a complete wooden structure with the helical screw foundation, similar to before. This is an existing trail section, which Jim Jean showed. And this would be what it would look like, again, with the proposed trail. Bridge number five, believe it or not, is over 500 feet. This is looking the opposite way. And again, you can see the, the walkway to the left. And now at Quickshawn Street, we are proposing F's curves going into Quickshawn Street, so it will slow down the people on the bikes. The signal on the right is where we showed at our last public information meeting. And there were a lot of concerns about how we were treating this intersection. So what we have proposed 
is a new pedestrian signal. As you see on the photo on the right, there were, it, this one happens to be um, solar panels. There will be two signs. And then the far right above the arrow is a flashing LED light similar to a, a, what's on top of a police car. And it's that visible. <coughs> the light will go back and forth, back and forth. And as you can see, you have to stop, you push the button, and this light will flash back and forth, back, back and forth. Again, similar to what a uh, police car uh, lights up. The um, compliance rate of vehicles traveling on a road is approximately 80%. So about 80% of the time, when a vehicle sees these lights, they will stop the lights will go by. Um, the one on the right, yes, I actually took the picture off the top trail. If you've been to the top trail fair, uh, this is on Route 1 right at top trail fair. I, I rode my bike and have driven my car over this. Every time I've gone over, cars have stopped. Cars actually stopped even when I didn't push the light. And then when I'm driving down the street, the, the light is visible from almost a football field away. It is really a bright light. And that pretty much concludes phase two. I don't see any line markings down in the bike path and any shadows showing people which way to walk or bike. Is that going to be or is that going to be an afterthought? No, the, on, except for urban bikeways, that you have the Minuteman. Uh, most bikeways do not have a pavement marking down the middle. It takes away from the rural character of the trail. Uh, the only place we actually do have... Bristol Bike Path has it. Right. Well, we feel that this doesn't warrant it based on the number of people that will be out there. So the only place we do show pavement markings is when you approach Crookishon Street right now. So there will be a, a, a what, solid, line, uh, solid white line for about 100 feet. Uh, just on the Cape Cod one, and that had it too, but that's interesting. Um, the gateway phase, is that the Bristol area, or what? which area is the gateway intersection? Bristol, um, you mean which section is phase two? No, no, no. Uh, gateway is paying for the uh, pay, uh, funding this, you said. Right. Um, who is gateway? Oh. Okay. Uh, the, phrase it that way. <laughs> uh, the Gateway City Parks program is a program run by the state's executive office of energy and environmental affairs. It was created through the 2008 environmental bond bill. Uh, this particular administration, Patrick administration, wanted to uh, basically have a program that could spend more money on parks in urban neighborhoods. They really felt we were under investing in parks, trails in urban settings such as the city of Fall River and really wanted to have a program focused specifically on that. And so that, that's the origin of the program. It's essentially state bond money uh, coming to you through the state's executive office of energy and environmental affairs. Okay, thank you. Um, one other question and I'll try to leave it for others. Uh, I noticed Rodman Street. You are going to go into Rodman Street that way. What's to prevent cars from blocking the entrance? Blocking the entrance? Oh, um, you mean if they're parking along Rodman Street? Exactly. There is a curb cut uh, there because that will be an access point for emergency vehicles. So it'll be marked as a no parking zone similar to any driveway. Okay, so will, it will be marked, unlike veterans, uh, veterans coming off their veteran bridge, which is not properly marked. It will actually be an access, so if you're driving your bike, uh, you'll be able to turn into this access. So it's open yeah. to the driveway. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hi, Dave Nanskorg, City Council. Uh, in anticipation that you uh, might need additional funding at some point, uh, it, might, it might behoove you to make a presentation before the City Council at some point. Uh, understandably, this is a public hearing, and you think there will be public interest. Uh, fortunately, uh, not everybody gets out to these meetings, including councilors. Uh, but it might, be, uh, it might be in your interest to come to the City Council sooner rather than later and make a full presentation. I'm not sure, again, not for any fault of your own, but I'm not sure the vast majority of people in the city of Fort Worth can understand and or appreciate uh, the amount of effort, time, and money that's being put into this really significant project and how it will transform that whole Cookishan area. Uh, so one of the other venues that you might want to utilize is to, is to come before the city council. It attracts a whole different group of folks, and um, uh, I think that uh, you might get a lot more public interest, or a different kind of public interest in the city council meeting. I'd be glad to help you with that. So, what, are you saying, uh, John, that um, the urban bike paths don't have the striping? 
No, the, the rural bike paths don't. For example, we designed the uh, Cape Cod Rail Trail, and there isn't paper markings on the Cape Cod Rail Trail. There's, there isn't. There no. isn't. I, I live in Fairhaven, and there is. Um, and that's pretty, pretty <laughs> rural. Um, and I guess I just I guess what I'm thinking of is issues around the fact that it's two-way traffic, right. that there are walkers, that we're trying to you know create social norms where people are respectful for one another and polite and do the right thing, um, but there sometimes there are ways that that can be helped along, uh, such as delineating that this is a two-way traffic or, or you know, stick to the right, you know, rat walkers to the right or whatever. Right. So it's just well, to bring that up again. To educate the people that are walking all right in that. Yeah. Well, but you're right. They do have um, educational signs with equestrians, pedestrians, and bicycles. So I guess we could put a couple of those up. I would it would be appreciated. Yeah. I, I think okay. it's a great idea. Uh, I'm frank on this. Is I'm also a member of the bike committee. Uh, photo bike committee, and um, uh, I have experience uh, of riding in Florida, where they're unlike Rhode Island, where pedestrians walk uh, in, a, uh, in the same direction, uh, opposite direction of, of bicycle traffic. They do in line with the traffic, and it's, it causes a lot of problems. Yeah. Uh, they're not aware of the cyclists until you make a noise, and then you startle them, and <laughs> whatever. And uh, I, I think an orderly way to uh, have traffic on a bike path is to indicate to pedestrians which way they should walk and cyclists which way they should, they should cycle. Mm -hmm. And it avoids a lot of uh, confrontation and right. confusion. We do have those signs. Yeah. Yeah, we've had so many complaints in the past when you do paint a, paint a bike path and it's a, you know, in a beautiful spot like this. It, looks, it does look like a mini roadway. It takes away the aesthetics. Of it. I'll accept signage over line. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now. <laughs> okay, the great. History of the wild and scenic river, because this may not actually have been in effect at the last, the last time we were here. I'm not sure. Great. But. Uh, Is that something we can learn about online? T t yeah. All right, Carol right. Cole. Cotton River, wild and scenic. All right. Are you talking about the fact that Quickershan was a male? For the main function of the mills in Fall River? Am I talking about that? Yeah. No, I wasn't, but it, but, but it, it is. It is. <laughs> yeah. That's I it. thought that's what you were getting at. No, it's not. What I was getting at is that it's a tributary of the Taunton, and the Taunton, because it's a tributary, it's designated as official federal wild and scenic river. Okay. However, uh, it also strikes me that there's a difference between the two sections. That the section, oops, uh, I guess three. Three. So three. Street out to Great Nav yep. is wilder than the than the bridges, um, and I don't know yes. what that means, but um, I think what it means is that it's it's really important to to keep the, the wild part. The last thing I have is, is the route. Now, it hooks up with Brooklyn Park. Now, does it go to Plymouth Avenue? No. No, no the access point from, from the right-of-way, the rail right-of-way out to Plymouth Avenue is, um, it's a really rough connection. It's very narrow at that section. The actual right of way that DOT owns there is um, very narrow. It's been encroached by, by some adjacent adjacent um, uh, properties there and been purchased off segments of it down at that end. Um, so the connection, we felt that the connection to Britland Park was A, safer and, and B, um, preferable to having bike access off of Plymouth Avenue. But it doesn't, there's the current Car path in Brooklyn Park. Yes, yes, yes. This okay. path connects up to the path that, that, that you're speaking path of. That you're there's one that goes just like this, right down the edge of the ball field, and then there's another one that goes along the river that the city installed, um, and actually goes okay, the whole length Okay, but the one that goes Brooklyn. along the, that's what I'm asking. Mm. Okay, okay. Now I see it. Yes. So that the phase two. Route yes. does not include the 
city capital on the river. It does not include it, but it connects to but it. But it will connect to it. Yes. So that the so that the city path along the river will not be the normal route for the bicy for bicyclists say coming from Provincetown and heading for it won't be part of the main route. No. You'll have to, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. Nina wanted to, to talk the about park. the wild and scenic, I think. Yeah. Yes. Um, we showed were the three places where we're going to do some planting. And we have a philosophy about that, which we just wanted to say a little bit about. And I, I've done a lot of work on an urban wild in Jamaica Plains near Boston and in Boston. And what we've tried to do there is make where you enter look as if this is a park, we want you to enter it, and to have that be more, have a more cared for look than further into the trail, which is wilder, because we want people to feel that, yes, they, this is a public area, you're meant to come in, but then after that, I mean, we, frankly, we don't, we don't have the money to have a manicured look for the full so mile. Glad. I'm and, so glad. And I, I'm, I am, you know, someone who played in the woods for my whole childhood, and I love, I love the wild look, but I also, in an urban place, you want to feel that, as a, as a visitor, that this is, this is a place that you're meant to be. So that's where we have the signs and the benches and the day lilies. And then we have wildflower meadow, and then we have what's growing in the west. Fabulous for Fall River. Um, but it's part of a much larger project, and as David was talking about Warren. We um, are part of the South Coast Bikeway Committee, connecting from uh, Warren, uh, not Warren, from Swansea to uh, Wareham. Um, we've been working for two years with representatives of all of those communities. Uh, I think there's eight of them, and so we see the the big vision of Providence to Provincetown. And as this being an enormous uh, and beautiful piece of that, that's going to, I think, excite and stir people to get more involved in the entire project, the entire vision. And as part of that, uh, with New Bedford, Fall River is applying for a groundwork trust um, where I think we'll be able to see some of those additional pieces uh, brought into a, you know, bringing the neighborhoods, um, Niagara and Corky Row and the Flint um, down to the river. And um, so it'll be expanding within the city, but also connectivity to all the other communities along the South Coast. Great. So you're doing a lot for us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We Thank hope you so. for being so nice to us, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any further further thoughts, questions? All right, well, I'll just thank you again very much for coming out to, to um, learn about where things are and what we have planned for the future. We really appreciate your support and all your comments and questions. Thanks. You can't wait for the first shovel. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs>